it's really just the same thing it was back then. It's like, do you want to get on a call or do you want to meet in person? And it's about finding your people. And that's really what the Dynamite Circle has always been. In fact, in 75 days, hundreds of listeners of this podcast will be in Bangkok for our 11th DCBKK. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Happy Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I have a lovely co-host. Boss man, welcome to the show. It's laundry day, huh? Ah. Uh, Don't want to talk about it? No. They can't see. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we got a three-parter for you. We are going to talk about revenue versus profit. We've got a wonderful listener question about that. We're going to talk about the inside scoop on our community's upcoming event strategy plus an opportunity to come join our team and how we're thinking about that. And we're going to end the episode with an amazing chat with the DC London team and how they hosted one of the best all-time DC events in London this year, which I attended. I had to call them up and get the inside scoop. So stick around or fast forward to that or whatever. It's going to be amazing. Let's jump right into it. By the way, can I just say at the top, the podcast is celebrating its 14th anniversary. Holy What cow. anniversary is that? It's some, well, I was just thinking about it in teenage years. Like you're probably getting braces. Yeah. You're a little bit awkward. The hormones are starting <laughs> to pump. <laughs> We're going to try and push through, Let's though. Pump this question. Make it to young adulthood. <laughs> All right, Ian. We're going to start off the show by reaching into the mailbag. We got a question from listener George. George is on the mailing list. You can check that out at tropicalmba.com. Sign up for the mailing list. George probably got a free copy of our book, plus a bunch of other goodies. Plus you responded to him, which... Pretty amazing. In 2023, I don't know how many people respond directly to their readers, but you do. And that's a nice thing. It's amazing. It's my top priority every day. Here we go with George's question. Hey, Dan, love the podcast with Sam discussing finances. I'd love to hear more on future shows about how you and Ian think about profit versus revenue, meaning are you optimizing for revenue growth or profit growth or both? Do you have specific goals tied to one or the other or both? I think about this every show when I hear your intro that mentions, quote, more profitable location independent businesses. George. Shout out, George. Thanks for the question. So first off, there's sort of a classic conversation online about profit versus revenue. Whenever this topic comes up, People say, stop talking about revenue. Why does everybody talk about revenue all the time? Talk about profit. If you could only know one thing about a business, would you choose to know the revenue or the profit? I want to know both. But I understand why people want to know the profit. Um, but also with the profit, it gets tricky because there's a lot of ways that you could slice it. You could decide to make a lot of profit. Some years you could decide to make no profit you are in control of the profit, maybe more so than actually the revenue. The revenue tells you about what that company's presence is in the world, you know, all things being equal. The profit tells you a little bit about industry dynamics, which is important because you can basically figure out the profit of a company if you know something about the industry. And then more importantly, in these smaller scale businesses, they tell you about the decision-making process of the founders, which is pretty interesting. One of the things I want to flag too is profit power is a huge factor in business. Something I don't hear talked about, like call it pricing power, the ability to maintain margins over time. In a lot of service-based businesses, for example, you're sort of arbitraging skills, sort of a delivery model, say like I'm doing X marketing service for Y kind of companies. And over time, as more services show up in that industry, those margins tend to degrade. If you feel like this might be the case in your business, there's a classic book on the topic called The Seven Powers, Foundations of Business Strategy, written by Hamilton Helmer. The fundamental idea is taking a look at your business 
to sort of shake out what its power is. And to the point that you were making, you want to know the profit, the pricing and profit does say a lot about the business's power in the marketplace. Yeah, I would venture to say that like most of the businesses that we're talking about on this show, not including like manufacturing, like the most profitable the businesses will be is day one. They seem to get less profitable <laughs> with competition, with your uh, cost of goods. Your like you're just making the pizza dough by yourself and you sell it. And it's like, oh my gosh, I just made $30 on that ball of dough. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have to get the real estate and you got Luigi and Mario back there making the pizzas. Yeah, 100%. And actually, we're going to get into that. So I thought it would be cool to talk about some like, common ways to think about revenue and profit. One of the ways like Einar from Tiny Seed came on the show and he talked about the importance of revenue growth year over year. So we'll call that like a startup or fund strapped way of thinking about revenue and profit. It's really important if you want to exit or like build up sort of the equity value of that company that you show that it's flexible in the upward direction. This is really common in SaaS. And you know, this is a legitimate way to go about growing a business. So I think it's worth giving a hat tip to the revenue year over year growth model. We don't talk about it often on the show. It's not our bag. It's a model. Here's another one. I'll call it the small business model. It's where you just simply conflate profit with personal income. Instead of saying profit, you just say personal income. I think a lot of businesses, especially small businesses, fall into this trap where they get themselves to a certain point in their revenue and then they figure out, okay, how am I going to carve out my profit or like my personal income? Yeah. And they sacrifice growth because of it. So, and I think that there, there is a strong relationship there. If you are simply plowing as much money out of the business as you possibly can, it's very hard to grow the revenue because you don't have an engine anymore. A lot of founders find themselves with this dilemma, which is like, should I make more money personally, or should I grow my business? The next model I wrote down here, is, Ian, is the Bezos strategy. Of course, the Amazon strategy, which is basically if I can generate equity value in the company or ROI. Well, in the case, we typically think of ROI as cash on cash, right? Yeah. But that wasn't it for Amazon. They're building out the equity valuation of the company by reinvesting and that's a really interesting strategy. It's almost diametrically opposed to the most common lifestyle business strategy, which is revenue minus expenses equals take-home salary. What Jeff is saying is like, I'm actually a badass and I've built the best value generator in the world or best value generator that I know of because I'm in control of it. So hell no, I'm not going to maximize for my personal take-home. I'm going to put that money back into Amazon.com the rainforest is going to grow back, all that. So there's also the profit first methodology, which is made famous by the pseudonymous, pseudonym, I think you call it pseudonymous, mm. the book of the same name by Mike Michalowicz, which is an excellent book and worth reading. The methodology goes revenue minus profit equals expenses. It's a cool thought experiment and it's a cool methodology. In fact, a lot of listeners to this show use it after having read the book. They say, Yo, profit is the most important priority in this business. That's why I have a business. So I'm not going to think about it as the thing that's left over. I'm going to think about it as the thing that's prioritized. And then I'm going to model my expenses to get to the profit. Awesome idea in concept. And having read a couple of Mike's books, my sense is this comes from a hard one experience, which is he wasn't taking enough profit boom, the business goes dead one day and then you walk away with nothing. That's a risk we're often taking as founders. But there's a reason that most of us don't have a profit first methodology. It ties back to what Ian said, which is it can hinder growth. And at least in theory, and I don't think Mike means it this way, in theory, the concept of what you want to make from your business could be numb to the reality of the businesses that you're running, right? And so you might want to be a little bit more nuanced than profit equals this number will get to number. Not to say that that's what the book says, but it's a cool methodology. Yeah, it could also bring in a question like the time horizon of the business too. Because like if you're a profit first company 
and you're just looking at the snapshot of like the year or like the month, it supposes to me that you might not be interested in what happens five years down the road or 10 years down the road. And the Bezos strategy, he has a real plan to like plow back money into the company and like invest and like raise the stock prices and continue to come out with products. My understanding of like the profit first concept is like there might not be a long time horizon for this business. So get what you can right now. Yeah. And one of the reasons, you know, there's two major reasons that lifestyle founders that we see take too much profit. The first is lifestyle expenses. Like they just got to live. And so what do you mean too much profit? Well, you're hindering the growth. Like Ian said, the other thing is lack of confidence. Well, I don't know what to do with it. And it's like, there's a bunch of money sitting here. Yeah. I might as well take it. And if that's the situation you find yourself in, well, maybe not such the worst thing, right? There are other cash custodians out there in the world. It could be your house. It could be your Airbnb investment. It could be dividend stocks or whatever. But I think the theme of this show is maybe find a way to bet on yourself a little bit more. You bring up a good point, which is um, I think most of us have started businesses like no pedigree, no, no money, you know, no help, basically. It was just us and an idea. And so we talked about rice and beans a lot, figuring out like how to live off rice and beans basically and extend your runway as long as possible. Well, what happens is like you're five, it's like, well, I was starting to get a taste for luxury goods and hamburgers, not so much the rice and beans anymore. And like a little yeah, bit of a uh, upscale ham in my rice and beans would be nice. <laughs> Prawns, not shrimp. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> And then all of a sudden you've got to service your Airbnb debt and your house debt and this and that. And then guess what? It's not actually your company comes first. It's my personal income comes first because I have to service all this stuff around me. And then my company comes second. Yeah. So I'm not willing to shove the profits back into the company because I have to like service my lifestyle. And that can be an unfortunate situation. So the question is, I think still, even in our early 40s, this is going to sound weird, but it's how long can you live poor? Can you continue to live poor in your 30s and 40s? And when I say poor, like, look, we're in Barcelona. We're living a very great life, but it's nowhere close to up to our means. And that means that we get to bump the money back into the business and still have it be the priority, which I think is essential, actually, if your trajectory is growth and not personal income. Love it. Next one I wrote down here is classic systems. Just call this the Peter Drucker basic, have your quarterly goals, have your annual goals, break it down based on your financial sophistication to divisions, to product level. Sometimes people even do this with individual contributors and their incentives in the business. So we're talking just revenue and profit targets based on your strategy for that year. Interestingly, over, overall, when it comes to small business, 20% net profit seems to be the number that comes up the most. I just thought I'd flag that up because it's interesting. These classic systems are interesting to me because I feel like uh, me and you like kind of argue about it a fair amount when we see profitability go down or like what we're spending on. And it feels to me like the classic systems are for like established entrenched businesses that have like been around for a long time and like have a lot of predictability. And I think it's like a weird thing to say that like 14, 15 years into your business, you might not have a lot of predictability. Most businesses do. Like if you're a used car dealership on your 14th year, you pretty much know what's going to happen on the corner of First and A Avenue, right? Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of inflection that can happen in these internet-based businesses. And it's worth flagging up because I think, again, if you get yourself in the habit of trying to hit these targeted numbers, like you might not leave yourself open to opportunities. Interesting. One of the things that we notice a lot We've called it superhero profitable. This is a Ian original, which is a term that we use internally to refer to companies that are only profitable because the founder is covering two plus bases. This is like a necessary thing that happens in the thousand days. And it typically happens through the life of the company. The classic example is the agency owner who's like the ringer salesperson, the project manager, the GM, the CFO all this stuff. And then like a potential acquirer walks in and he's like, it would cost me $600,000 a year to replace you. Yeah. And I think it's really fascinating when you think about how you want to think about this in your business is to ask yourself how much value you're contributing to the business in terms of bore. 
value over replacement. Can you be replaced? We all can. What's the dollar figure? And then does that change the way in which you look at your business? Speaking of superheroes, to me, this just is like Batman, right? He can never really be himself because he has to go out and be Batman at night. So he's like stuck in his business. It's like no one can replace Batman. There's nobody that can fit into that Actually, suit. Batman's been replaced quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Only on screen. So when we talk about the superhero profitable, I think that this is a trap that a lot of people fall into, which is they found themselves in a business. Again, they're making a good personal income. The second they want to step away from that business, they can't do it. Interesting. What about an ROI framework, which is where and how is your money going to come back? So the basic idea is how much return will I get on each dollar that I spend? Rather than saying I want to have X profitability because that's industry standard, well, maybe you could be unstandard in the sense of how you can return cash on cash on that dollar, how you can build equity value on that dollar. You could represent any cash flow, equity, or future proofing. But like you said, you also have to consider it in time frame. Like, well, what time frame are those things going to return to me? For each dollar, how, what modality, and over what time frame do you expect it to return? This is where things come off of the balance sheet yeah. and become about your intuition and vision for the business. At a certain point, I don't care how good your CFO is or how entrenched the corner of first and A is, you got to have a little bit of vision about what you expect to happen in your business, and in your industry. And that's where I think thinking through things in terms of ROI can make sense. Like I believe this five bucks invested in this way five years from now will be this. Honestly, the reason I bring it up is because this is like where things get interesting and tough. In terms of this ROI framework, we invest our time in our businesses really early on and we don't think much about it. It's just like, this is what I have to do. I'm the only person that can do it. I'm going to get this business off the ground and it works. And then you're like, oh my gosh, it's like making a little bit of profit here. Now what do I do? Like, I know how to invest my time in my business, but like, how do I deploy my cash back into my business? So most people just never do. They just take the cash out of their business. They put it in their bank account and like, that's it. The business rises to like whatever level it was going to rise to based on the talent, the market conditions, all that stuff. And then there you are. But I think what you're saying is like, it makes sense to place bets back into your business with the cash. And this is really hard to do. This is like the difference in my mind between like being an investor and an entrepreneur. You kind of have to be like a little bit of both. You have to like make a bet in your business that's not based on yourself, but it's like based on everything that you see and where the company is going. Deploy the capital and then hopefully understand whether or not it produced an ROI in your business. And so even trying to figure out if there was an ROI, that's a pretty difficult thing to do. It's like, you could like plow yeah. it into marketing or whatever. They, okay, that's like pretty legible. You could like have some kind of strategy. Okay, now it's getting a little bit less legible. Yeah. So I think the ROI framework, it's really difficult to grok like how it's going to work out. But I think in terms of like inflection points, there's a huge upside. If you yeah. can put capital back in your business and it can return in a meaningful way. Yeah. I'll tell you what's really easy to have an ROI on is your time, right? That's the one we always talk about. Yeah, I'm going to hire somebody. I'm going to go to dynamitejobs.com. I'm going to hire somebody. I'm going to get my time back. Bam, ROI. We talk about your lifestyle. Bam, future proofing. That's easy. I'm going to like redo my software. I'm going to redo my website. That's pretty easy. But I think this idea of ROI, what you're talking about, is the line of business owner and entrepreneur. And I think that that's why it's difficult. So back to the initial question that got us into all this, George is asking us, how do you guys think about profit versus revenue? The reality is, is our perspective on profit versus revenue changes every quarter and annually, which is when we look at it and we're constantly fussing with it. Constantly. Yeah. Give you an example of this. Uh, when we sold our last business, we were really concerned about the profit. And like we backed out owner expenses like a year before. And we started to like make it look as good as we possibly could because we knew that the multiple was going to be based on that profit. 
if you're in a position where you have a decent amount of profit, maybe too much profit, like you've got your lifestyle covered and you have a vision for how your business can grow, then maybe your profitability should be less. Maybe instead of 20%, it should be 5% because you got your expenses covered and you have a vision for the future. So when you say like we're rejiggering it all the time, it's completely true. And it does depend on the business too. So you have like an Amazon business and um, you have to like invest in inventory and like product development and all this stuff, like a little bit more clean cut and dry in terms of like where your margins need to be to kind of survive in that game. Some of these other businesses I think are a lot less legible. So if you find yourself in a position where you're curious about like what your profit should be, my suggestion would be start with like your livable expenses, figure out how far ahead of that you are, how long you can stay there, and see if you have a vision for the future of your business. And invest, invest, invest. So basically live cheap, reinvest, kick ass. 100%, unless your idea is to sell within like three years, and then maybe you might act differently. Thanks for the question, George. We appreciate the opportunity to talk about this topic. We'll talk about any topic, really. Let us know what you think. It's Dan and Ian at thisdomain.com. Ian, briefly, before we're joined by the host of DCX London, one of the all-time great DC events, we invited him on the podcast to share how they do it. In fact, I said, whoever comes onto our team in the future that hosts events, whether it be a member or someone on our internal team, I want them to listen to this interview to hear about just how they think about events and how they were able to pull off such an incredible event in London. So we'll get to that in just a few minutes. First, I want to talk about our event strategy in 2024. So much of what this podcast has been about for the last 14 years has been about bringing listeners together in person. In fact, those early days, I think essentially the pod was basically just a beacon. I mean, it's really just the same thing it was back then. It's like, do you want to get on a call or do you want to meet in person? And it's about finding your people. And that's really what the Dynamite Circle has always been. In fact, in 75 days, hundreds of listeners of this podcast will be in Bangkok for our 11th DCBKK. And we're working frantically on that. But it gets better. In the next 12 months, we will have more DC events than we've ever had in a calendar year ever before by some order of magnitude. I just want to get into some of the details of how that's working out. First, that's comprised of member organized juntos, meetups, and DCX events, which are member hosted events. In fact, Ian, basically what we're seeing is in a post pandemic era, we're just seeing so much demand for DC events. So this year, we really focused our team on that. We've been manually connecting members in the forum, creating surveys. We've built a locator application. So all members have their base location and their trips now when they sign up for the forum. We've created 80 plus WhatsApp local groups, some of which buzz all day long, some of which only buzz when someone comes to town. In July 2023, we hit a record of 27 Juntos, which are our monthly meetups on the third Thursday of the month. So those are cities all around the world, from Denver to Tape to Tokyo. Plus, we had over 40 meetups, whether it's casual for coffee, co-working sessions, small presentations, steak dinner. Yeah, hundreds of listeners of this podcast are meeting up every single month. But get this, we still don't have the capacity to support all these things. In fact, just recently or upcoming, we've had member-led events in Taipei, Lisbon, New York City, Miami, Denver, Gold Coast, London, and get this, Antarctica. What? Yeah, home of, the, home of the ants. Yeah, I'm telling <laughs> you, there's a DCX Antarctica. All right, it is real. I tweeted about it the other day. The <laughs> ship looks amazing. It kind of feels like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Like, I'm very tempted. So let's speak about once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. We are currently hiring someone to join our team. And part of this episode is I want them to listen to this episode to hear directly from us about how passionate we are about not only the ability of this person to change the lives of our customers, but to really see an inflection point in their career because of the work they'll do, because of the experiences they'll have, and because of the network that they'll gain. So I think we fumbled the ball a little bit with our initial recruiting kind of take. 
sometimes you rock up to your recruiter and you're like, I want this. We want an event planner, you know? And then the recruiter goes and does it and they bring you a bunch of event planners and you're kind of like, yeah, I, I don't really want an event planner. <laughs> <laughs> Our poor team at Remote First Recruiting, it's just like their eyeballs couldn't have rolled back in their head further. And it's like, <laughs> oh, okay, cool. It's like, uh, you guys are good at what you do. We suck at what we do. We're sorry. <laughs> Can you try again? <laughs> Oh, by the way, like none of this, like all that is events I was listening off. We didn't even mention like our DC Black events coming up or like all the kind of new ideas we have coming down the pike. There's just so, so much. I think the bottom line is we're not meeting the demand still Yeah. of how many times members want to meet up in person. You know, 40 plus meetups in July could easily be 60 or 80. There's more people that want to meet up than we have meetups for. The other thing we're talking about a lot is the quality of the meetups. Now that we have instant data on where members are and like what their business types are, I think there's a real opportunity for us to make more tailored, interesting, proactive events that, that have like real vision and leadership from the team. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about among many things for the next year. So here's the realization that me and you had is this is not just your next event planner. This person really needs to think of themselves as a community organizer too, and someone who's able to build relationships, a high level communicator, someone that has business savvy, someone that can make a case for their, their strategy, sell it to the team and execute it with autonomy, but also be a great team player. So not to say that many of the people we interviewed weren't those things, but they weren't all of those things. You know, most event planners, Ian, here was like the realization. Here's the difference between like a community organizer and an event person. An event person plans an event and then goes to the event and makes sure everything was as they planned. What we're looking for is someone who can organize potentially hundreds of events a year and not go to most of them. Of course, they'll go to the big ones. But if there's 12 members getting together for a small sharing session, a talk and a steak dinner in Barcelona, as an example, I'm not going to fly in for that. But you need to have strong communications. You need to have leadership. You need to be able to talk with the stakeholders, make sure that our community guidelines are met, make sure that's a strong DC vibe on the ground. You need to be able to do that virtually. I think event planners are people that are biased towards the in-person action. That's awesome. Not really what we need. So there you go. If you know somebody who would like to join our team, change their career, deal with the boss man and I is sometimes incompetence, but sometimes lots of fun. Yeah, come join us. We're retooling this recruiting process. And part of what this episode about, like we said, is showing one of the best examples of an event in the DC community we've seen throughout the years. The DC London community is incredibly vibrant. And so much of that is to do with today's three guests. We asked them to come by the show to share with us their thoughts about why they're inspired to host events, how they do it, and how the rest of us can model their actions. So let's roll it. Without further ado, the DCX London crew. Hey, if you like the show, just want to remind you, we have a website, tropicalmba.com. You can click through on your phone, check us out on the web, hit that subscribe button, and write the newsletter every week. There's a lot going on behind the scenes of the pod, and that's the best way to find out about upcoming events, both virtual, in-person, and much more. Check us out at tropicalmba.com and give us some feedback on this brand spanking new website. Because it's time for a spanking. So this is like the first four-way, I think, ever. So. Let's go around. I want to let the listeners understand your voice, your name, what it is you do. Hey, I'm Shona. I run a business called Perfect English Grammar, and we make online courses for non-native speakers of English. Beautiful. Go ahead, John. Hey, I'm John, and I run Data Driven Marketing, and we help online course creators to two to five times their revenue through email marketing and funnels. Beautiful. No, bring the energy, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Noel, uh, based here in London, and I run jobrack.eu, and we help online business owners hire really awesome remote team members from Eastern Europe. Beautiful. All right, guys. So I've been thinking a lot about events, and I've been inspired so much by your event. It just got my wheels spinning so much, and now we're hiring an event person. And so I'm going to make them listen to this episode. 
I want them to learn from what you guys have done. So we're going to get into a little bit of that. But I kind of thought at the top, you know, most people listening to this podcast aren't going to host an event, but they might go to one. They probably will. And sometimes when I look at an event sales page or a registration page, I kind of have this emotion like, ah, my living room's comfortable. I got a lot to do. I got a busy life. And that's why I wanted to ask you guys about these vignettes from your experiences at events. Sometimes like those little details that are the reasons we are motivated to go. So I'm wondering if you could zoom me into any event that you've been to at any time and share with me one of those animating details. Maybe we could start with you, Noel. Yeah, sure thing. So for me, way back in 2017, when I joined the, the DC, I traveled to the Juntos. So the London Juntos, these are the meetups that happen once a month. And for me, this was like a three hour trip each way. So I would travel up on the train and meet up with the London crew. And it often said that you're the average of the people you surround yourself with. And for me, I lived in this beautiful part of the world by the seaside in the country, it was not an entrepreneurial hotspot. And so for like one night a month, I got to level up and it was awesome and met this amazing group of people. And I remember this one particular time I was having a chat about workouts uh, with a, an amazing guy and he was talking about how he was doing spread, uh, sprint workouts on the treadmill. And I'd been doing some of those too. And I'm like, oh, cool. W what's your workout? And he's like, oh, yeah, I do this. I do these intervals. And like, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm running at like 12 and a half miles an hour. And I was like, what? And, and literally, I was like, what do you mean 12 and a half miles an hour? Like, treadmills don't go that fast. <laughs> and I literally thought that treadmills topped out at 10 miles an hour because that's as far as I'd ever been. And I felt like my legs were falling off. And so it completely reframed, first of all, what treadmills could do. And as a result, I then started running faster, things like that. But this experience of having things reframed has happened again and then again and again. Every time I'm hanging out with DCers, whether it's at the London Juntos, whether it's at, you know, DCBKK or any of the other events we've been to, just having these conversations with people that are growing, whether it's in business or in life, so often just things get reframed and things that previously I just didn't know were possible are suddenly like, oh, oh, okay, you're doing that thing and you kind of look like a normal-ish person. Maybe I can do that thing too. So yeah, that was definitely the big thing for me from coming up to the Juntos. I think Noel had been coming for about six months before I asked him one day. I was like, wait a minute, where do you live? You're actually traveling three hours each way to come to this. I was like, oh, I, I just had no idea. I assumed you lived closer. I think we all did, yeah. Yeah, John thought I was in Devon, London. You know, not, <laughs> not Devon, Devon. <laughs> what about you, John? Do you remember moments that animated you? You've been hosting these meetups for so, so many years. What was it for you that animated you to get out of the routine and to spend an evening out with strangers? Well, the reason I got started with it, so I attended DCBCN, which was a, the official DC event in Barcelona way back in the day, 2016. And I was just like, man, this is a cool group of people. I need to find, I need to be able to see these people more often than once or twice a year. So that's why I'd started organizing the Juntos in London back in the day. Back in, when would it be? 2017, I think I started organizing them. But for me, like one of the biggest things that I've got out, like it just really, really stands out in my memory at the moment. It's very recent from the DCX London event that we ran last month was I basically had one thing that I was trying to figure out and I talked to everybody at the event about it. Like every single person that I talked to, I was like, this is my thing that I'm trying to figure out. And I try and explain like, this is what I'm going through. This is what other people said. And every time I explained it to a new person, I got a little bit more of an insight or I explained it a bit more clearly. And by the end of it, I was like, oh, and I realized I'd had this massive mental block where I'd been really, really good at getting the business to run really smoothly without me. But I had therefore stopped myself from getting involved at times when actually I could help move the business forward faster by being involved with it. So I'd like, I'd swung the pendulum too far. I'd gone like heavy on traction so early that I'd got everything running really smoothly and then I'd stopped myself from being allowed to be involved. And now what I've done since DCX London is I've got back involved in a couple of projects and I've been moving them forward way faster than it would have done if I'd not been personally like jumping in and actually doing stuff on it. And it's really fun. I'm like, Sh I can't believe I've stopped myself from doing all this cool sh just actually being involved in the business. So, and there's no way I could have got that. I mean, hypothetically, you could do it online. If I'd set up morning to evening networking calls with like, you know, 
10, 15 people a day, something like that. And just, but it's like, I don't know, I never would. Whereas when you turn up to an event, it happens organically that you talk to all these people and you have these conversations and you get these insights from it. It's interesting. You're like workshopping this concern that you have in your business the whole weekend. Yeah. But also seems kind of scary. Like, what if they say something that you don't want to hear? Did you think of it like that? Or you're like, I'm just going to bank. <laughs> People often say things I don't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Shona, could you bring us into your world? Something that animates you to come to these events, fly all around the world, all different kinds of events too. I mean, I'm curious as to how you feel when you're looking at that registration page. I absolutely love in-person events. And the story I was going to tell you was a business one where my very first DCBKK, which was in 2019, I was super nervous to go. I'd been to the Juntos for a couple of years, but I hadn't attended any of the big events. And there was lots of like, are these people going to be out of my league? How am I going to feel? Like it was all super nervy. And when I went... My absolute realization was that everybody's normal, especially or definitely the people who I really admired online. They were normal humans. They were silly. They were partying. They were having normal chats with me about normal stuff. And it made a massive, massive breakthrough. It was a huge breakthrough for me, this realization, because suddenly it was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it too, because I'm also a normal human. And so it was quite similar to Noel's realization. I think it's one that loads of people have at these events. But if you go to like a mastermind and everyone's online and everyone's kind of serious, you don't get it because you don't get all these like little silly moments with people that make them seem like real humans and not like super people. And I actually doubled my business the following month after DCBKK. Um, was that a motivational thing or was it an informational thing? It was that there was loads of stuff that I knew that I should be doing, but it was totally in my head. The idea that these strategies, they might not work for me, they're maybe for other people. I won't implement them well. There was all that kind of stuff. And I got home and I was just like, of course I can do this. Did it? Worked. Which was absolutely wild. What I'm hearing you say that I relate to is I recently read a post by John talking about traction with him. And traction digested vis-a-vis -vis John's business somehow makes a lot more sense to me than traction in theory. And, and being able to like dig into that in person and then kind of workshop it across time seems to really move the needle for me in terms of getting breakthroughs. Totally. No, when you were speaking, I thought, okay, you're getting all these like breakthroughs, this reframe every time. That sounds like it could be annoying eventually. Like so, at some point you're like... <laughs> I just got to work. I cannot be reframing this stuff all the time. Do you have this concept of like heads up and heads down? What's the right amount of events to go to? Or how do you think about that? Because sometimes I get this feeling like, yeah, I'll just chill at home and do some work rather than reframe it again. Yeah. So as someone that's coming off the back of doing seven trips in the first six months of 2023, might not have had the balance quite right. But at the same time, I remember like my first couple of DCBKKs, and you plan like, hey, how long shall I go to Bangkok for? And then it's like, hey, what should we do with the Monday? And it's like the Monday was pool day because I needed to distill the pages and pages of notes that I had. And then what I found is that after I've been to a few events, I kind of give myself permission to not make tons and tons of notes. So the amount of information that I'm recording is, is way, way, way less. Some of that is because I'm a little bit more certain about my direction and kind of where I'm going. But also it's because I kind of, hey, I'm there for different reasons and I can go and hang out with the people and just, just almost absorb things and not worry about it kind of shifting me. Also, again, if something gets reframed and it reframes me in the right way, then actually I should change my priorities. Uh, that's absolutely the right thing to do. In terms of the right number of events, uh, most of them are like three, four days. It's not like it's a two week thing. And in every single case for me, the energy I get and whether it's informational or motivational, like you said, every single time it's got this insane ROI. And just without any doubt, every single event I do just pays off hugely. Um, and they're fun. And it's how I like hanging out with people. And it's what's the coolest thing for me right now is that I've got this amazing set of friends that when I see them, it's not like, see you soon. It's like, hey, I'll see you in Bangkok or I'll see you in Miami or I'll see you in New York. 
and there's a thing that we're planning that we're going to see them again. So it's just for me, it's now just got this global set of friends and there's, you know, that's another reason for me to go to the events. There's this debate in the event industry in our, especially like in our crowd that, uh, let's just get rid of talks. I'd like to hear your guys' hot take. Should we get rid of talks? So we had a really long discussion about what we were trying to achieve with DCX London before we ran it and how the talks kind of fit it into it. And one of the things we'd found in the past was we'd done really, really practical talks. And the talks would be about how to improve the SEO by this particular specific technique or how you can run better email marketing or but one way of hiring, you know, where, how we manage hiring people. And what we found was the talks were relevant, super relevant to a small percentage of the people in the audience. So each talk was really great for some people. And we wanted to change it a little bit. We'd seen some of the stuff that worked in DCBKK, some of the stuff that worked in DCMEX, some of the talks that we'd really got a lot from, found really useful. And we decided we wanted to do a couple of things. One, we wanted to have uh, more connection with people and we wanted to have vulnerability. That's like our two big themes for DCX London. And so some of the talks were specifically aimed at this is the journey that I went on in order to get from somewhere to somewhere else to kind of normalize the, if, it's re if it seems like it's really hard, it's because it's really hard. So you'd given a talk back at DC Max that had been really open about some of the stuff that you'd gone through. And you talked about some of the stuff that had been hard and how you dealt with it and how difficult it was. And because of that, what I noticed was, what well, we all noticed this separately, and then we talked about it afterwards, was that everybody else at the, for the rest of the event was more open about what shit was hard for them. And because of that, there were much deeper conversations and then you form better connections with different people there. And that's what we were trying to do. That's the out, outcome that we're after, is help people to have deeper conversations about the stuff that's going on, what's difficult, how they're going to deal with it, get more help and support from others, make better friends, make better connections. And so by getting the speakers to lead the way with that, by talking about something that had been really difficult for them and how it wasn't all sunshine and roses, then it was making everybody else in the audience feel like, oh, well, now I'm able to share more stuff as well when I'm having these conversations with people too. Are we over-indexing on pain, Shona? Oh, interesting. I think it's, I think there is a bit of a balance there. I've heard people talk about you know, networking events where they go and everyone just bigs up their business and like tells everyone else how great they are. And that is completely not where I'd like to be. I think it is also wonderful to share wins. And so when we're talking about like people telling their stories in talks and so on, it is lovely for there also to be a good outcome because the whole overcoming the pain is perhaps more inspirational than I'm still in the pain. I think it's definitely a balance. Uh, we ended DCX London by teaching all of our attendees how the correct way to celebrate a big win. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's an arm movement. There's a, a thing that you need to say inspired by John. So we, we, yeah, we absolutely do focus on that. I think in talks in general, talks for me are like kind of a, a really important part of a sandwich. It's the thing that will actually kind of help inspire a lot of conversation and helps people to kind of justify coming. Because if we said, hey, we're going to do, we're going to run an event and we're going to have lots and lots of time for you to have great conversation. Despite the fact that we know that actually that's the biggest bit of the value for people, I have a hunch that people, less people would be inclined to attend. And there is something about, you know, when a talk finishes, then being able to say to someone, oh, hey, what did you think of that? Or, oh, I don't agree with that. Like, what's your experience? I think it provides like kind of some common, kind of common glue that brings people together. Uh, especially where it's either a you know really inspiring story or a really interesting point of view, things like that. So I think talks still definitely, definitely have their place, but it's not the majority for me now. I think that that makes sense to me. It's like the mayo. You know, if yes. you're just going to sit there, would you like to have a spoonful of mayo? No, but put it on the sandwich, please. So it connects the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could list off some strong perspectives that you guys had about how to run an event What's great about events that then we can continue to incorporate going forward um, in the DC? And I wanted to start off with name badges and name memory. Maybe Shona, you could kick us off on this one. I think you've elevated the value of names to a degree that I haven't quite seen. Give me a, a sense for where that came from and what are some ways we can implement that? 
Yeah, so there's two different perspectives here. So firstly, I think people feeling like you know who they are is really, really important. And I've been to, I was a member of a group in London once where I met the founder, there was only about 30 people in this group. I met the founder like three or four times. And on the fifth time, he said, who are you again? And I'm like, I've introduced myself all these times to you. And it just didn't feel great. Like I wasn't expecting him to know my name, but if he had, it would have been really cool. And I love the idea that people feel really welcome. Like it's a little bit scary to go to your first event when you don't know anyone. It's even scary to walk in, even if you do know a few people. If somebody knows your name, it just feels really special to me that the organizers or, or anybody who's there is aware of who you are and sees you. One of the things at DCX London is we do have name badges and some of the smaller events don't have name badges. And it's actually true that I did have to have an argument about this. And I was not on the side that you might expect because I'm actually anti-name badges because I generally okay with remembering people's names. And I don't like name badges because my spelling and my pronunciation are so different and everyone <laughs> gets my name wrong. And so Noel had to convince me that everybody else would benefit from having name badges. And I was convinced. What was your argument, Noel? Because I noticed that we were wearing our name badges everywhere, into the shower, wearing my name badge. Just, 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 I noticed that as well, Dan. Yeah, yeah. That's why we make them. That's why we make them waterproof, right? Yeah. So my perspective was, I'm not great at remembering names, and I also speak to a lot of people on calls on Zoom as part of, like, from a business perspective. And so I hate, absolutely passionately hate that feeling when I meet someone. I've got a hunch that I know them. I've seen them before and I can't remember their name. Or if I go and say, oh, hey, I'm Noel. And they're like, oh yeah, we met. And I'm like, it's like a head in hands moment. I really, really hate it. And so it was almost going, as Shona said, a lot of the DCX events historically have been smaller, more chill, things like that. And we were discussing this and I was like, I think name badges is the right thing to do. But name badges feel a bit cringy, a little bit networky, you know, not the kind of vibe of a, of a DCX event. And so it took some real thinking about it. And so then we were like, okay, how can we make them fun? How can we make them useful? And, you know, I now do name badges at really small events. If I'm having 15 people over to my place and some of them don't know each other, we will do name stickers. And because it makes it better for people, people use each other's names and everyone feels more comfortable. Just as an organizer, you have to get over that discomfort of saying, hey, we're going to do name stickers because it sounds quite cringy because people have that negative association. But then when they have them, they're like, oh, this is so much better. So yeah, it's like that, someone's got to step up and take the hit, right? Yeah. To like do exactly. the icebreaker, to put on the name yep. sticker. I think you arrived at the conclusion that I've arrived at, which is that whole journey as well. <laughs> and realizing that it also is a bummer when you go to an evening party and people, you met them earlier that day for the first time. And you know, it starts with a T. <laughs> You know, and, and like it was a good convo, but you, you've been really taking in a lot of information. <laughs> Do you guys remember, have you been to an event recently where you were an outsider and what did it feel like to try and break in? It's as organizers of events, sometimes you can be a little bit removed from that feeling of showing up and not knowing anybody. I went to an event last year and about 80% of the attendees were had been to this event and this community before and they knew each other really well. And it was actually the first event that had happened for three years because of the pandemic. And so they were really excited to catch up with each other. And so there was definitely, and it's a wonderful group of people. I've counted many of them are my friends now, but I do remember very much that real nervousness of like, hey, will they like me? Am I going to fit in? How, what's the right kind of way to kind of, you know, which conversation do we start with and things like that. And there's a real kind of sense of, yeah, trepidation and real nervousness. And that, as Shona mentioned, you know, with Shona learning people's names and us all kind of putting an effort into that for DCX London, we don't want people to have that feeling. That's kind of a big thing for us is how can we make people feel super warm and welcome, even as we've increased the size of the event, that's hugely important to us. And that's a big thing that the three of us discuss when we're saying, hey, how many tickets shall we sell? What size do we do it? We still want it to have this warm, welcoming, like homely kind of feel. Another priority that you guys had. So number one, name badges. Number two, backup plans. 
<laughs> oh, and a backup for the... Tell us a little bit about why backup plans are important. So there's a moment, right? We're getting, we've taken these two double-decker red London buses over to the park for masterminds on the Saturday. And Noel has been obsessively checking the weather forecast every 15 minutes for like five days. <laughs> and he's like, it's not supposed to rain. It's not supposed to rain. We're going to be all right. And we're getting off the buses and it starts to rain. Like the moment we start to step off of them. And out of nowhere, Noel pulls out these two bags of umbrellas, enough for every <laughs> single person attending the event. And so me and him are furiously like handing them out to everybody. And it stopped raining again like two minutes later. But it just made everybody feel like, oh, these guys have got us. Like everything's under control. We can just chill. Everything is going to be good. And if it had carried on raining, then it would have meant people still weren't getting wet. And what's I don't know if you know is there was a backup plan for that backup plan as well, which is if it rained more, there was another whole venue that was booked just in case it rained more that day. So whatever happens, everybody gets to have a good time because shit goes wrong, right? I mean, it's London. Sometimes it rains. It was our first time at a DCX London event having any rain, but it was like we knew that it was going to happen one day. I love that. What would you have done if uh, a couple speakers didn't show up? Oh, we've had that. We've had that. <laughs> so when we did DCX London Christmas back in 2021, two of our speakers had to drop out. They were poorly and they couldn't make it. And... You kind of juggle around, you kind of adjust the agenda. You kind of, we, in, for this event, we had one talk in our back pocket. John and I basically are normally the backups in that sense. Yeah. And so it's just figuring out. I had a big moment on the Thursday night of DCX London when we had like 100 people in our very first part of the weekend doing the kind of cocktail party and doing icebreakers. And I had this real realization that from that point on, nothing else mattered. Everything could have gone to shit and it would be fine because the point was we brought the people together. They'd figure it out, right? So as much as it didn't, and we had tons of, as, as John said, we had backup plans of the backup plans and we wanted people to have an amazing time. Once they've arrived, actually, you know, if we ended up getting fish and chips on a bench by the river, people would have been fine. They, they were, they'd arrived, they were there, they were having the conversation. So it, there's an element there of being able to relax about it. But as someone who's mildly organized, I take a lot of pleasure in <laughs> yeah. I take a lot of pleasure in kind of, you know, going to what some in the group here might describe as going too far. For me, I just enjoy it. There seems to be in line with that principle, Noel, a sense of that simplicity of logistics is important around these things. Cause you kind of want to get out of the way of what magic is gonna happen. How would you guys think about how complicated to make the event versus versus just making it simple for people to get together. It seemed relatively simple to me. Was it a concept that you guys thought about? Oh, yes. <laughs> we were very intentional about like the geography. London's big and it can be slow to move across. So we very intentionally chose a, a main venue that was close to the, the hub hotels that people were using. We were trying to keep things as much as possible within walking distance. And where we had like the park that wasn't within walking distance, we put on transport and made that like a real fun thing. So one of the things that we really learned this time is that, yeah, but it being simple for the attendees is hugely, hugely important. Like take all of the kind of fuss and thinking out of it for them. But that does add a lot of complexity for us. But the realization this time was actually, there's almost no such thing as too much that we can do to make it easier for the people coming. So we take on that complexity because it gives them a, a much better time and just smoother time. Speaking of which, Shona, one of my items on my list is that there was no complexity about where I was sitting at dinner table. Ah. And, and I'm curious, I want to hear the inside dirt as to how you matched us up at the tables and what are some ways that other people might think about making matches if, say, you don't know everybody so well. Uh, what are some approaches to that? So we had planned seating for the opening dinner and I absolutely love doing planned seating because it removes the, that awkwardness, especially for new people of where am I going to sit? Like, who is it okay to sit next to? Am I interrupting a clique? All the kind of nervousness there. And it forces people who are, who have 
gone to 20 events to mingle a little bit. Like there's loads of time to get together with your old friends, but we also want to create this kind of feeling that the whole group is getting to know each other. So that's one of the things that we did to help try and promote that feeling. When I'm thinking about how to organize the tables, it's really hard, actually. First, I randomize it. Then I think about introverts and extroverts. So as far as, obviously, I don't know everyone at the event, but I try really hard to make sure each table has at least one extrovert, preferably two. So I kind of mark people as extroverts in my, in my head and put a, like, There's certain them people that you can rely on as allies, right? Totally. Like, is, if this person is at that table, that table's good to go, basically. Exactly. <laughs> so, I, so I do that. It's completely true. And then also I do, as far as I'm aware, try to think about who might get on with each other. Like last year, I remember I made a little section of table because all the people there were interested in music. And I don't know everybody's interests, but I try to, you know, have a look on the forum. I look on the forum at everybody's profile. I try to think about what I know and just try to mix people up a little bit as well. I don't put people next to their close friends if I can help it in that particular situation. That was very cool. And you, you guys also had like a conversational menu. Where did you get that idea? So I actually... So I'm really interested in how conversations work. A couple of years ago, I did a three-day seminar about how to have better conversations, um, as in I, I attended one. And the person who ran that seminar, I'd attended one of her events years ago in London where she had a conversation menu. And it was all about trying to get beyond small talk. And since then, I've seen it pop up in a couple of other places, but it was really from this one in-person event I attended probably 10 years ago where I first saw it. Damn, I would be terrified going to the Conversations Summit. This is like everything is so high pressure. <laughs> <laughs> What's the punchline of like, could you summarize like some key insights from these leaders? Yeah, I mean, it, there's just lots of stuff about how to ask good questions, how to make people feel comfortable so that maybe they want to tell you more. It's often just taking a little tiny sidestep away from our kind of natural, obvious replies. So one example from this conversation seminar that I did was just when somebody says, how are you? You say, instead of saying, fine, you might say 7.8. And, <laughs> and it just gives them a little like pat and interrupt. And then you'll often get a better conversation there. But then there's also ways to get into the like full on, you know, lovely, gnarly, meaty, show me your soul conversations, which are. For sure. I think I love. And I got into a couple of those during the weekend, which is never like, I guess somewhat expected, but you just don't know when it's going to happen. And those are always like one of my biggest takeaways. Speaking of conversations, you guys had a version of the two hour cocktail party by Nick Gray. John, I was in your group. It's one of those things that's like the name tags. Like you go to, I like recently went to a Gento and we were all just kind of like talking and I was like, I'm going to be the guy. Quiet down, everybody. Like, let's go around. And it was really valuable, you know, and you guys did that at the beginning of, of this event. And I thought it really set the tone. Could you bring me into the two hour cocktail party world? And what do you agree and disagree with about um, Nick's methods? And we're, t we're referencing Nick Gray's new book. Yeah, so this is, so Noel and Shona have very much been the ones leading this and they actually run two-hour cocktail parties at their houses quite regularly. The thing that I've seen, um, I've not read the book, I've not gone through it, it's, it's been very much Noel and Shona leading on this, but what I've seen is it means that everybody's forced to meet everybody else in a nice, friendly, helpful way. So it gives everybody a chance to hear everybody else's name multiple times, hear a little bit of information about them, mix everybody up so everyone doesn't just talk to the people they already know. And then you're more likely to have a conversation with that person later on because you, you've heard their name, you've heard something about them, you've got more of that kind of initial connection and then it's easier to follow that up with a proper conversation later on. And so what we've done at DCX London is had three different icebreaker groups. There's 100 people were split into groups of, I think, 10, 10 or 12, something like that. And then everybody was in three different groups. So you've, you've seen or heard from like 30, 35 people already within two hours of it. And then you break off and have the smaller conversations afterwards. So 
our idea when we're starting out the weekend was how can we get as many people to meet as many people as possible really soon so it's then everybody's really comfortable. And we got feedback from the attendees afterwards as well saying, I didn't know anybody, but I felt really comfortable really quickly because you've got this whole process to make, you know, allow me to meet people. It reminds me of the concept Shona brought up, which is you get this kind of like conceptual coverage of more people. Whereas if you were to do it without the structure, it's like Noel flew in from where again? Whereas I felt like um, that really was successful in something... I'd like to see more of at events. Definitely. It's really powerful. And you can play with the icebreakers you, you kind of choose to use. So when Shona and I, maybe we're running kind of things at our houses and maybe we know people, we can go deeper. And so we ran a workshop at uh, DC Mex where we taught people how to do it. And in fact, Nick Gray actually came along, which was slightly terrifying, <laughs> presenting and teaching people how to do the thing with the author of the thing. And Nick's an amazing guy. We're you know, good friends now. It's awesome. And, you know, there we, the two of the icebreakers we did were, or the kind of most, the deepest one was, you know, what, tell us about a vice of yours and tell us a good memory. And that, that went deep really fast. And as uh, whoever's leading the group, you set the tone. So if you're kind of open and pretty raw about something, then it really encourages everyone else to do the same. So it's, it's super powerful, but you don't need to go super deep. You can do, hey, you know, what's your name, where are you in from, and what's your favorite breakfast? Because you can just start gently. And as John said, it's just, the whole point is just to get people talking and meeting each other. And it's, it's really, really powerful. Is there anything else you guys would want to share about DCX London? Something special? Something that you'd want other event coordinators to consider? Or hosts? I mean, I think one of the, the big things about it is figure out what do you actually want to achieve with it? What's the outcome? What's the emotion that you want people to feel at the end of it? And that's how we started. We had, I guess it probably would have been like six months ago, discussions and debates about like, okay, what is it that we actually want people to experience and to feel and to be able to say afterwards? And then the whole thing was work backwards from there in terms of, okay, how many people we're going to invite? How many talks we're going to have? What kind of venue we're going to be in? How far do we want people to have to travel? What kind of hotel are we going to be staying in? How many people can we manage to get together at breakfast? Like all of that stuff was based around how can we give people a specific experience that we want to have? And it's not starting from, oh, let's put on an event. That means we're going to have this many talks. Let's go find a talk. It's like the talks themselves were based around, we want people to have this experience. They'll have that experience if they have these conversations. They'll have these conversations if they hear these kinds of talks. And like the whole thing worked backwards from there. A principled approach. Yeah, it's inspired by Priya Parker, wrote a book called The Art of Gathering. And she says, whenever you're planning any event or gathering, it might be dinner with one friend or it might be a conference for 5,000. What's the purpose? And thinking about that, and that is exactly, you know, as John said there, we were really intentional going, hey, what is it we want? And then to feel we welcome and them? to feel open. Yeah, it was connection with our like, connection. word for the purpose. So we wanted people to feel part of the family, essentially. Shona, what's your lasting memory of this year's event? I absolutely loved the way the group kind of cohered. So it feels like it's possible in three days and it, it's absolutely down to the fabulous people that we have in the DC that a group can come together and lots of first timers, lots of people who know maybe one or two people. And at the end of the conference, in my opinion, it just really felt like we were so tight. We were, you know, made friends you could call at 3 a.m. We really kind of came together and it just felt really, really special. What about you, Noel? So we, we did a hard thing and we did make this year considerably harder than any previous year and it worked. And a huge sense of pride for me. In, and it's not about the fact that we, I don't know, arranged buses or we arranged particular things. It's about the things that we did enabled that connection and there's a bit when we're getting the feedback in after the event when we're talking to people and just the level of kind of passion and emotion that comes through from people talking about you know the awesome time they had the amazing friends and people that they met is just like fills us up completely and also the three of us grew as a team and we're in a mate it's a great team that we have kind of and our volunteers as well in arranging the event but i think we did a hard thing we made it harder and it worked and then we grow as a result and people have a great time. 
Indeed they did. John, your lasting reflection on DCX London 2023. Yeah, for me, it was very much on the Sunday afternoon when everything pretty much is done and we all stood around in a cool bar, drinking champagne. I just had so many people come up to me and be like, oh my God, that was so amazing. Thank you so much. Like people are telling me, right, I'm going to be redoing this stuff in my business because of this. I, like it's, you know, hearing these this openness from these other people makes me feel like I found my tribe. Like really, you know, I felt a real connection because of all the stuff that you guys put together. Uh, it was really overwhelming. It was like I was uh, really emotional on the kind of Sunday afternoon. Pretty sure, pretty sure that Nolan Shona did most of the hard work on this one. I kind of feel like <laughs> not not quite convinced you should be thanking me, but I'm very. But go on then. <laughs> not true, by the way. Yeah, you guys did an amazing job. We appreciate on behalf of the DC. We appreciate all your hard work. It was a wonderful event. It really had a lasting impact on me for sure. It was cool. Can I take some of your guys' time? to ask you for our DCBKK attendees how to DCBKK, how to do it. Like, what are some hacks? Because we make a podcast or like some kind of guide every year and people were asking us, so for example, dress code. <laughs> people ask us about this. How early should we come? Do people go to Chiang Mai? I'm going to answer all these questions. I love to answer them. But you guys know a lot about... I got very strong opinions. And I want to hear your strong opinions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people deserve to know these strong opinions. So here's my way that I do it, which I think is very different to a lot of other people. So I make a schedule in advance of meals that I'm going to be having. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. And then I plan in who is it that I want to meet with at each of these things. I really, really like hanging out with people over food. And I like hanging out with people in small groups. So like two or three people. And so I go through all the people who are attending the event and I start asking people, do you want to meet up some point during the event? And I, I plan that in with them. So I will have like one-to-one -one breakfasts or dinners or whatever with like people who either I know already and want to see again and want to spend time together or people who I'd really like to get to know better. So Andy Fawcett was one of those at DCB KK last year. And Andy and I had kind of messaged for years and he'd been on my podcast, but I didn't really know him personally all that well. So we organized for the two of us to go out for uh, dinner at a Japanese restaurant in the Comrade Hotel. And it was great. And we had really, really deep conversation. And it was, it you know, had quite an impact on both of us, I think. And so that's that's one part of it for me. I don't attend a lot of the talks because I need a lot of time when there's that many people around to just chill a little bit. So I go sit by the pool at the Conrad and I'll spend quite a lot of the time in between the meals hanging out there. And then, in the, you know, then there'll be a few people around and I'll kind of talk to people in smaller groups there. I find it really tiring when there's a lot of noise going on. So I don't go to the evening drinks for that long. And instead I'll go, you know, meet with somebody in smaller groups or have you go to a cocktail bar or something. Like that. I'll go on the Monday before the event. So I kind of settle in, get over jet lag, chill out, see some people quite early there as well. And then I'll stay a week afterwards. And last year I did Chiang Mai for the first time. This year, probably going to go down to the islands, maybe to Phuket, something like that, and hang out again in a kind of smaller group. We're going to go somewhere luxurious, find somewhere fancy and go hang out and be fabulous. I noticed Noel, <laughs> that's a great rundown. That's exactly what I've come up for, John. Thank you. I noticed, Noel, you mentioned that Chiang Mai is hectic. This is not... So I, my mind's been blown by this call. Shona calls... DC or is normal, first ever. <laughs> first time ever, but she's the English pro. I'll let her have it. No, you're calling, you're calling Chiang Mai hectic. Um, have at it. I want to hear about the plan and how do you approach DCBKK? First of all, like Shona's bubble is almost the same as mine. It's almost entirely DC. -ish. So we don't know any normal people. <laughs> so we think of our people as normal. We're not, obviously, as, as Tommy Griffiths says, right? We're all weirdos. Um, so just to put that in context, I think DC for me, DCBKK. So the start date isn't the start date. Dan, you and Ian and the guys, you keep telling people the start date like is on the Friday. It's not the Friday. It's the Tuesday. 
everyone else knows it. It's like the in, it's like the in joke. So for me, yeah, <laughs> arrive like three days earlier. And that's lovely because there's meetups going on. There's just things going on, smaller groups, which is really cool. You can kind of get the lie of the land, recover from jet lag, et cetera. And I think the big thing for me is like, you do you. You know, yeah, there's a conference agenda, but there's a whole bunch of like side agendas going on. And the conference app that you guys use, you know, there were so many meetups arranged last time, which was amazing. And you could just jump in and out of stuff. Lots of them around the pool bar, which is great. So you can have the event that you want to have. If you're super introverted and actually get super tired hanging out with lots of people, you can just find little groups um, to do. There's always people that are willing to go for dinner, hang out at the pool bar, things like that. I'm a big fan of getting in some like WhatsApp groups or using the event app for this. So, you know, we always create a Brits-ish in Bangkok group, like for people coming in from the UK and special friends and things like that. And so we arrange dinners. So, you know, one of the nights we had like 20, 30 people and another night might just be 10. So getting in to like little groups like that and with everyone is welcome. So if anyone is coming to BKK and it's their first time, we'll just get in touch and we'll get you in our, in our WhatsApp group and get you out for dinner and things like that. So I think the big thing is create the event that you want to create and try not to worry about the FOMO. Just, yeah, kind of like try and, and see what kind of works for you. And then as John says, yeah, we're planning on heading right down to one of the islands. Chiang Mai was a cool place. It was felt like being on like a college campus because you'd cross the street and you'd see other yeah. DCs, which is amazing. But it's a, I don't know, small city, right? And so it, there's not, unless you get out into the, kind of into some of the treks that you can do, which is great. It's not wake up, lounge by the pool, have great chat in a super relaxing environment, which is what we're thinking of this time. And again, the more the merrier. There's, there's a whole bunch of us looking at it. and I like welcome. the choice of Phuket as they have a nice luxury infrastructure. Some of Phuket is hectic in the traffic and things, but there's plenty of space around the island for amazing kind of villas and hotels and things like that. Shona, you're you're wearing the, your DC BKK shirt. I'm curious as to what are some of your mindset about approaching the event? And I'll, I'll weave these uh, advices into our DC BKK literature. So I absolutely love going to Bangkok. I think advice, especially for first-time attendees, like the guy said, go early. Tuesday is a good day to arrive. Make sure that you go to meetups because like we found with DCX London, being in a small group with people allows you to meet them in a kind of much less scary way. You don't have to approach a huge group who are standing you know, across the conference room or whatever. It's the same thing for doing a mastermind. In the mastermind day, you get to know your fellow mastermind ease. So go to as many of those as possible and don't be worried about like joining, you know, if there's people going for dinner in the event app, just go. Everyone's lovely. Never, ever worry about approaching someone. Same at breakfast. It's fine. Like it's normal, standard DC culture to just sit down or ask someone, obviously, but if you can sit at their table at breakfast and unless a couple of people are having a meeting, everyone says yes. And it's a great way to meet people. The other thing I wish somebody had told me before I went is one, it's really, really cold in the Conrad. You need far more clothes than you think for the That's actual conference days. Um, the leather jacket's quite good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in the evenings, it is the case that people sometimes dress up. So if you would like to bring a nice dress, that is totally appropriate for Bangkok nights. But it's absolutely not obligatory if you want to wear shorts and flip-flops. That's also cool. Sweet. That's it, guys. Thanks for coming by and sharing your thoughts and uh, experiences. I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Dan. No worries, Dan. Thanks, man. Yeah. Have a lovely day. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.